So we're going to be there and just go back to Luke 18, verse 9. And we're going to be in Luke 18, verse 9. And that is the, uh, the, the verses for the message. And the title of the message today is The Fame, the Lame, and the Same. The Fame, the Lame, and the Same. And this message is actually geared towards our Baptist uh, brethren, uh, preachers, and churches throughout this country, and specifically here in Houston. So this whole month, we've been on this uh, spiritual battle against the Sodomites, you know, against those that uh, would be rejected by God, against the reprobate Sodomites. And one of the things that's really stood out to me is how little support, but actually more importantly, how much opposition uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, these men that have stood you know, and between the gap, have stood the gap and are preaching God's word, have received from so-called Baptist preachers and Baptist brethren and sisters in Christ. And if you look there in Luke 18, verse 9, I think this is the problem. It says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And a couple weeks ago, I was talking about humility versus pride, and how pride cometh before the fall, and a haughty spirit before destruction, and how if we're not humble in this life, God is going to humble us. And we see here that you know this Pharisee, this over-religious individual, is, is full of himself. And he thinks he's better than everybody because he doesn't commit certain sins. What he doesn't realize is he commits other sins. You know, obviously, if I'm not a murderer, that doesn't make me less of a sinner. I'm still a liar and I still, you know, have bad thoughts and different things in my life. But, you know, the thing here is that the publican, he wouldn't even put his eyes before God. He, he was humble before God because he knew who he was sitting at the throne of God. If he were to be in front of God, and I mean, obviously... I'm talking metaphorically, but he knows that God is the Almighty, God is the All-Powerful, and he's the one that gets things done. But what we see here is that the Pharisees, by this point, you know, and, and this is throughout their history, they'd gotten so puffed up that they could actually, in their mind, point out, you know, what was their righteousness and what wasn't. They, they knew better than God. They could sit there and tell God, look, you know, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. Thank you, God is what they're saying, that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. And then he proceeds to tell God all the great things he does. He says, I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift, his, uh, lift up so much his eyes unto heaven. And the problem we have with society today is, you know, no, these men of God aren't standing up for Christ because they think that they're, they're doing the work of God. They're so self-righteous that they think it's enough to go out there and just show up to church and, you know, to pray a good prayer and to be seen of men. And then these, these mega church leaders or these false religions get up behind their pulpits or whatever they want to call and, and claim the name of God. And what they forgot to do was actually listen to God and listen to the word of God and what the word of God says. So what today we're going to focus on is how do we get to this point and you know what is it that we're we're looking at. So the first thing we're going to focus on is those famous preachers. And I'm talking about fame like we know it today. You know when you think of someone famous, you don't think of a preacher. Not in our vernacular. Now the Bible actually uses the word fame correctly. If you look at the at the word fame, the 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 actual uh, definition, all it is is a public report or a rumor. You know, it's favorable report, report of a good or great action, report that exalts the character, character, celebrity, renown, uh, to make famous. But unfortunately, today, in today's society, if you're a Christian that is famous, you're probably famous because you've been on the news for being uh, shunned by society. You know, these 
these preachers and these pastors that uh, you know I stand with that are filling the gap, they're famous right now worldwide, not because you know they came out on some slick Hollywood movie or preached a message of hope or uh, wealth, health and wealth like Joe Holstein. No, they're famous because they said that Leviticus 2013 is absolutely correct and that sodomites are worthy of death. That they should be stoned, they're, they're, uh, or that Leviticus 18 is true, or that Judges uh, 19 is true, or that Genesis 19 is true, or that Romans 1 still holds true to this day, and that God's word is true and through no matter what, right? And so we see here, and I'm going to give you an example just of the difference between the fame that we're dealing with, that I'm trying to, you know, the, our modern vernacular and how the Bible describes fame. If you don't have to turn there. In the meantime, turn to Matthew 23, Matthew 23, but in Matthew 4. 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse disease and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those, and those which were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and, he, and healed them. And, they were, and, they, and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. And so we see here that Jesus had fame, that the rumor spread of the great things he was doing. But he had fame not because he sought it, but because his works were pure. Now the Pharisees were famous because they made sure everybody knew they were famous. We're going to show you in the Bible. And the problem today is that nothing's changed. We still have Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and false prophets that are going around patting themselves on the back saying, look, look at me and look how wonderful I am. If you turn there to Matthew 23, uh, if you turn there to Matthew 23, we're going to be there in verses. We're actually going to look at a lot of the, the, the passage. And then after Matthew 23, we're going to be in Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So turn to Luke 16 and keep your finger there. But here's, a, here's a, an example of what I mean. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a series of six pastors plus pastors from all over the country that didn't preach. And then church members and brothers and sisters in Christ that don't have a church that they regularly are able to attend that's similar to ours. Show up to Orlando, Florida for a conference that all uh, the name of the conference was Make America Straight Again. That all they're saying is that the Bible is true and the world has it wrong. That homosexuality is a mental disorder, you know, that they're worthy of death, that they're perverse, that they're wicked, that they're evil. And then more importantly, also that they're pedophiles and psychopaths. And basically the Bible likens them to dogs or animals or brute beasts. And the out uh, the outcry of of the of the people has been one of twofold. You know, there's been a small remnant of people that are like, you know, that's great preach it, you know, we're going to back you, that's incredible, and people have lost their jobs, some of these preachers have lost their jobs, their families have been attacked, they, you know, and, and they're, they're rejoicing in that, because the Bible tells us to rejoice in tribulation and in reproach, but then there's another group of people that have been attacking them, now the world, we expect that, right, obviously, you know, a, a filthy sodomite, when you tell him that he's worthy of death, is going to get mad and, and tell you that you don't know what you're talking about, I mean, that, that's expected, but you don't expect that from other brothers and sisters in Christ who should know the Bible. And the reason that they do that is because, unfortunately, you, they fall into one of these categories. They're seeking uh, fame and fortune, right? You know, we've heard that since we were little. I remember when I was in business, the main thing I wanted to do was be famous and have a fortune. Fame and fortune is what I sought. You know, and so these people are individuals who are seeking worldly fame seeking worldly recognition you know just two churches now i looked it up statistics change over the last years but for the most part probably 20 percent of all mega churches in the country and mega churches are usually churches that are like 10,000 plus 20 percent fall in the state of texas so i should give you some indication of how great texas is not you know, I mean, if, if we've got mega churches in Texas, that means we've got a lot of false religion and false gospel being preached. You know, and here in Houston alone, we have two major uh, mega churches. Number one, we have Lakewood Church with Joel Falstein, you know, where he's sending people to the pit of hell 
with his false gospel of repentance. And Joel Olstein wouldn't stand uh, against the sodomites if he, you know, he wouldn't stand against the sodomites if his life depended on it. I mean, he, he is on record, multiple interview after multiple interview, where he will never define that line. You know, if you ask me today, is sodomy a sin? Absolutely. Is it an abomination? Absolutely. Are they worthy of death? Yes. Of death? Yes. Is it uh, a reprobate mind? Absolutely. Can they be saved? No. The Bible is very clear on that. It's 100% clear on that. If you, if you don't get that, then open your Bible someday. You know, just start in Genesis. You're going to get to like chapter 9 where Noah is uh, basically abused by his, one of his children after the flood. And, you know, thank God that he doesn't, you know, give us details into that wicked lifestyle so we don't have to think about it. But if you look there, they have, I mean, look, you're there in Matthew 23, but Lakewood has 43,000 people that show up to services weekly. I really think it's more because I think that they're only using the statistic of the English uh, services. They're not including the Spanish services. According to statistics, there's about 6 million people in the Houston area with the surrounding suburbs, 2.5 in Houston proper, 6 million surrounding. You're, so approximately 1% of the Houston population goes to Lakewood Church. 1% of the population is being brainwashed with this doctrine of hell. Then the other church that we have here that's big, and, I mean, I, and I'm not including all the ones like the one off of Beltway, Grace Church, and there's all these other churches here in the area that have huge congregations. I'll just pick two. Second Baptist Church has about 24,000 people. Now, this is the old statistic, so it might be higher than that now because I think they have something like 10 campuses. I believe at one point, if it wasn't Ed Young, it was some other pastor, but one of these mega church pastors, they had so many campuses, they actually had a helicopter flying to the different locations so they could make the different, uh, the different services that they had spread out. So Second Baptist... It's part of the, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention, and if you know anything about the Southern Baptist Convention, they wouldn't agree with us on doctrine, you know, if they're life dependent. And I know I'm using that a lot, but I mean, I'm just saying, these guys don't have the right gospel. Now, if they did have the right gospel, let's just assume they have the right gospel, they're not preaching the doctrines of Christ. They're not preaching the entire counsel of God. You know, there's a lot of good Christians out there, and what I mean by good Christians is, I think anybody who's saved, it's, it's a good thing to be saved, but they're just off backslidden or they're, they're being fed incorrectly or they're not giving the right thing. And the reason is because the man standing behind these pulpits are looking for fame. They're not famous for their works. They're not famous because they got banned from 32 countries or they're not famous because you know they were a 20-year detective and lost their job because they preached a, a, a sermon on Leviticus 2013. They're not famous because... They decided that, that the Bible's right and they're wrong and they changed some of their doctrine and their church kicked them out so they had to move to Orlando, Florida. They're not famous for that. They're famous because they told people, hey, we're famous. You know, Joel Osteen's like goes around the country promoting his like one-day seminars. He's more like a motivational speaker. Ed Young does the same thing. There's always all these commercials. They hobnob with, you know, dignitaries, both uh, Republican, Democrat, so it doesn't really matter. They don't stand on God's word. You know, if you, you couldn't pay me enough money to go to a fundraiser for any one of these sodomites that are looking at, to run for office. I mean, unless you pay me so I could tell them that they're going to the pit of hell. But, I mean, you don't need to pay me to do that. I'm going to be like, you're going to hell because you're a reprobate. But for that reason, you, I mean, you just couldn't pay me enough to do that. Go to Matthew 23 and let's look at this mentality. It says, Then spake Jesus to the multitudes, verse 1, and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. See, a lot of people talk a good game, but it's all talk. They never walk the walk. I remember when we were in, in uh, high school, at junior high, that was the cool thing for our generation to say. You know, oh man, you just walk the walk, but you, I mean, you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. And you know, if somebody was gonna pick a fight with you, they'd be like, oh, he's all talk, he didn't even walk the walk. But what I'm asking you is, what God's saying is, look, these guys that are looking for fame and fortune behind the pulpit, 
They're all, they're all talk. They're not walk. It says, verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one, one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Be, but be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humble that shall be he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And then before we read that, just you know, here's a couple of things that we see. The Bible is saying, look, don't let anybody call you master. Some of these guys get masters in divinity and PhDs in divinity. You might as well. You might as well just be falling into this thing. You know, I, you, you go and you see these guys that are preachers and they're like, oh, Dr. So-and-so and, -so and uh, preacher so-and-so who has a master's in this. Look, I didn't even go to Bible college. I was ordained at this local church. And I, the, my, my learning comes from the Word of God. You know, I'm not very smart, you know, in the eschatology and theology of things. I've not read a lot of the commentaries. But what I will say is, I am uh, smart when it comes to the Word of God because God gives me His authority through His Word. You know, I had someone ask me earlier, what do I think about religions? I think that they're horrible because religions confuse people. And the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Religions confuse the, the fact of the matter because people get up from the pulpit and say, look, we are Catholics and the church is your salvation. And what do they do? It says that, and they love the upper room at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And they love to be called father. But the Bible says, call no man father. So then out goes the Catholics. It says, but be, uh, but be not ye called rabbi. Well, there goes the Jews. And then everybody else, neither be ye called masters. You know, there's a difference between called a pastor and going around calling people a doctor. Or when you introduce them, you say, hey, look, I'm introducing Pastor so-and-so. You know, he runs this church and all this instead of, I'm introducing to you Pastor so-and-so who has a master's in this and a PhD in that and a bachelor's of this and, a this and wrote this book and did that. That's these guys that are looking for this stuff. But what did, what did he say in verse 11? He says, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Look at verse 12. It says, and whosoever shall exalt, uh, verse 13, but woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For neither... Go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So there's something very specific. You know, I'm talking about the super famous. I'm not talking about the lame. Most of these guys are not going to go into heaven. Most of these guys are false prophets. Most of these guys are probably in the reprobate category. And it says, uh, Woe unto you, scribes, hypocrites, for you shut up kingdom, the kingdom of heaven against men. For neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And that word suffer just means allow. And you're not allowing others. Because see, every time that 43,000 people show up at Joel Olstein's church, they think that you have to repent of your sins. And guess what? If they die in their sin, they're going to hell. Because they have not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of, uh, of God. You know, we were talking to a guy right now, just so winning, just a few, or not right now, just a few, uh, few hours ago. And his whole argument was repent. And repent and repent and repent. And he says, but you got to try. And I, and I showed him the verses in Spanish that about in Romans 4 about works. You know, that it, you know if, you, if you're relying on your works, it's a debt to you. And he says, well, I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about trying. Well, look, at work, you have to try to do the work. That means it's a work if you're trying to do something. You know, you're, you're arguing semantics. Let's keep reading on there. It says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. You know, these guys, they get up and they give you these big, fancy prayers. They're receiving the greater damnation. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You know, 
What do I think about religions? I think about religions as they're from the pit of hell because it says they're making twofold more of the child of hell than yourselves. Basically, you're damning yourself and you're so wicked, you're going to damn somebody else with you. It says, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. And, and obviously, if you were to read Matthew, we see a bunch of woes that God's talking to them, and we don't have time to go into it. I mean, all of these uh, chapters and scriptures are great. I mean, I could have probably just preached on just that one set of scriptures, but what we see here is that these guys are seeking fame, and in the process, they're damning people to hell. Go to Luke 16 and go to verse 14. And it says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things. Luke 16, verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. They hated him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, that for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. I think it's interesting that he's saying, look, you guys are looking to please yourselves in front of other men and that's an abomination. And then he reminds them that the God's law will never change. So what it tells me here is that these guys not only are patting each other on their back, but they're patting each other in the back on doctrines that they've changed in the Word of God. And today we have versions of the Bible that I refer to as perversions that remove or add to the Word of God. You know, I remember when Christian music started getting famous, which is, you know, not fame-like because it was good. When, and I'm not talking about hymns. I'm talking about contemporary Christian music. They came out with this thing. I think they still do it. I, I don't know. Um, you guys can tell me later. But it was called the Dove Awards. And it was basically, what was it? It was, uh, for that which is highly esteemed. Uh, and he saith unto him, ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God, know, God knoweth your hearts. These people get up and they basically try to recreate what the world does, which is, you know, the, the equivalent of, I, I don't know which was for music, Oscars or Emmys, but it's the equivalent of one of these shows where they give each other a double award for singing. You know, instead of just singing praises to God and knowing that God gets the glory, they sit there and act just like the world. You know, they sit there and do things just like the world. And it says, what does the Bible say? It says, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. God thinks it's disgusting. He doesn't just say it's a sin, it's an abomination. And then he reminds them of the word. Go over uh, to Matthew 6. Go back to Matthew. So that's the famous people. You know, they, they're, they're looking. They're always patting themselves on the back. The only time they do anything. And, you know, remember a couple years ago when Hurricane Harvey came through and all the churches or everybody was coming from everywhere to help out? And Joel Olstein, when did he open the church? Not when it started raining. It was like two or three days later when people called him out. What did he do? He did it for the esteem of men. He didn't open the church when it mattered. He opened the church when he thought he was going to lose traction and popularity. That is what God is describing here. He only wants the fame when the fame means that he can tell people how great he is. Right? It's not about being famous like Jesus who, who they heard of his great works and of the healing and all that stuff. The other thing that we're, we're going to look at is we're going to look at the lame. Now these guys... They don't specifically, and, and, and I'm going to name some churches here. I'm going to call them out. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're in one of these churches, serve at that church. I, I, I think that at any point, any church can become a lame church. But unless you're willing to move your family, you, you can find another good church. I, the first thing I want to establish is that all I'm doing is calling our brothers and sisters in Christ out and saying, hey, it's time to, to, to be in one accord. You know, I've never been to these churches. I don't know these pastors. For the most part, the, the website where I got them from, you know, they preach the right gospel and they try to, to filter this through. But my frustration is just the number of churches that could have stood with us just here in Houston alone. You know, and they can stand with us even today. And what I'm doing is this message with the lame is to call our brothers and sisters out and say, hey, where are you? You know, if we would just stand up, you realize that the sodomite agenda, these queers, these fags, 
they're only like two or three percent of the population. You know, according to statistics, 70 percent of Americans are Christians. If we could get just 20 percent, man, we could just get 10 percent of Americans to stand up against sodomy. That's three times as much as the sodomites themselves. Man, they'd go back running into the closet, scurrying like little, you know, like cockroaches when you turn on the lights. And then your children would be safer, right? And we wouldn't have to deal with all this perverseness and wickedness and all these things that they're trying to go after. Because, I mean, ultimately, in my opinion, their final goal is to get the children. I mean, now they adopt children. Now they want to say that there's no age of consent. You know, all these things that they're trying to change. But, you know, what's lame? Well, it's not lame like in the Bible, you know, where you're lame because you, you hurt yourself and you're limping. I'm talking about lame, like imperfect, not satisfactory. You know, someone who's just got a, an excuse, like a lame excuse, right? Someone who, it's not smooth, uh, it's, it's uh, imperfect or unsound. And, and I'm going to give you a list of churches. You're there in Matthew 6. We're going to be in Matthew 6 quite a bit. Uh, and then we'll wrap this thing up. But you're, you're there and there's, just here in Houston alone, Helmer's Street Baptist Church. Now they say they do soul winning, but then it says bus route and, and visitation. Usually when, when I see a church that says they do soul winning and visitation, visitation seems to be the greater of the two. I don't know them, so you know if they're doing soul winning, man, keep at it. Praise the Lord. Hopefully they can show up to the next conferences and just fight the good fight with us. I, I don't care if you get the label or if they recognize or don't recognize you. Look, if men of God are preaching God's word, you should be with them. Whether, you know, they like you or not or whether you're recognized or not or whether you get the label that they get or they don't, we should all stand together in God's army. But let me tell you, the devil, he's organized. And he's fighting that fight. He's going to take as many people with him as possible. And it's about time that the remnants stand up and bow not, the knee, uh, bow not the knee to Baal. Then we have the Church of Katy. Christ Church Baptist Fellowship. Christ Church Baptist Fellowship, that's where I got saved. Let me tell you something. They have their salvation right, but that's about it. And I know because I personally dealt with some stuff there. And I'm calling them out. I'm calling Dr. Johnny Pope out. Hey, where are you in this battle? I'm calling all their deacons out and all those church members because they, they say they stand on the word of God. Where were you two weeks ago? I guarantee you most of those emails, if they sent them, were on the opposite side. Isn't God love? And we shouldn't be judging people. And we shouldn't be persecuting them. When God's very clear how he feels about this agenda. You know, you got North Houston Baptist Church. Shady Acres Baptist Church. They say they do visitation. Parkwood Baptist Church. Iglesia Bautista Libertad, Gideon Baptist Church, Green Valley Baptist Church, Northwest Baptist Church, Freeway Baptist Church, Central Baptist Church, Cypress Creek Baptist Church, Lincoln, Lincoln Wood Baptist Church, and the only one I'm not going to pick on, because if, if anything, they're probably stronger. They have a, more soul winners in our church for sure, and they, uh, and they have a great leader. It's Pure Words Baptist Church, because the, the website I got it from was one where this, this church pops in. But I'm talking about, and I know for a fact, Pure Words was represented, and so was Steadfast, because Pastor Shelley was at the event. But here we go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen churches, well, fifteen that I got off this registry, and what I was actually looking for was just Houston churches. Four, fifteen minus one is fourteen. Duh, right? I learned my math in school. Thank you for, you know, I'm not, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you have 14 churches that claim to think like we do, that claim to believe like we do, and they're nowhere to be found. And you know what's the sad part? Is if I were to meet these church members one-on-one, -on -one, they agree with us on all these issues of the sodomites. They know that homosexuality is a sin, that it's worthy of death, that it's wicked and an abomination. It's not like it's anything foreign to them, but what are they? They're afraid of men. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie, it's not fun to be persecuted, it's not fun to be attacked. But the Bible says, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Where are these brothers and sisters in Christ? I didn't even include the Baptist churches around here because most of these aren't like independent fundamental Baptist churches like Clay Baptist just, you know, three, 30 seconds down the road is Southern Baptist. I think the same thing with uh, 
the one uh, Springwoods Baptist Church, and then you got Long Point Baptist Church. I think all of those are Southern Baptist. I didn't include all the, the, the churches that just had Baptist in their name. I try to look for the most like independent, most King James only, most conservative, like most uh, hardcore churches that I could find in Houston based on this website. Now, like I said, I have not been there. I do not know these people individually, but I also don't see them anywhere uh, out and about with us. Now, if I'm wrong, I'll eat my own words. If any one of these guys wants to email me and, and correct me on anything or call me directly, you know, just call the church and I'll, I'll definitely answer the call. But I know not. I know that for a fact. So as a matter of fact, and I want to make that clear, the only church that, that, I, that I would stand with here, because it's the only one I see out there, and the only church that's doing anything uh, great for the Lord, in my opinion, from these, is Pure Words Baptist Church. You know, I've actually met Pastor Shelley. I know a lot of their church members. I know that, you know, when Pastor, I mean, uh, Pastor, Brother James and I were out soul winning today, they were out soul winning today. I know that while they were out soul winning, so were the other churches that are, that are part of the new, new independent fundamental Baptist movement. I know that because that's what they do. And if they're not soul winning today, guess what? Sometime in the next couple of days, they're going to be soul winning because there's more than one soul winning time. As a matter of fact, if you were to just combine all the churches that stand on this issue and, and you were to look at the soul winning times, somebody's soul winning at some time somewhere during the week. Like every one of these churches has a soul winning time that will fill one of the slots in the week. So, and you say, well, what does soul winning have to do with preaching a hard message like this and standing against the sodomite? I really think that when you're out there in the spiritual battle, you realize how wicked it is. You realize how bad it is. You realize how, how disgusting it is. But let's not get distracted. Let's go to scripture and then close out. We're going to close out quickly. But, you know, I just wish these, you know, all these churches that I mentioned, hey, let's get on the fight. Let's get in the battle and let's push back. You know, God is on our side. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We shouldn't have anything to fear. Well, the only thing we should fear is God himself. And the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. But go to Matthew 6, verse 1. It says, Take heed that ye do not your alms, alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret, he himself shall reward thee openly. A lot of these churches, they, they secretly but openly, it's kind of this weird paradox. They know who the, the biggest tithe giver is. And even if he's living in sin, they'll know what sin he's living in. And the pastor won't, won't preach about that one specific sin. He knows that family members have sodomites in their family, so he won't preach about sodomy heart. Look, I have two queer uncles, and let me tell you, they're worthy of death. As a matter of fact, the sooner they die, the better it is for our society. I'm just going to make it real clear. You know, my, my, my mom and dad know this. You know, it makes them very uncomfortable to hear that, but that's, re that's the reality. I've dealt with them. I know exactly how they are. They're wicked as hell. You know, go to Matthew, uh, let's go to verse 5. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray for thy father which is in secret. And thy father, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions. Sounds like the Catholics to me. As the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard of for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for the, your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask. You say, why is this in the lame if it's talking about the Pharisees? Because maybe they're not looking for, for fame and fortune. Maybe you've never even heard of these churches, but in their congregations, they do their alms to be seen of men. They make these long prayers. I've been to Baptist churches where, you know, you get these like long, dramatic prayers. Look. That should be between you and God. And I'm not against, you know, I mean, we pray here publicly, but it should just be a quick, short prayer to God, and that's it. The heart prayer, the passionate prayer, the one that matters, I don't want to hear about it. The only one that's interested in it anyways is God Almighty. You know, if you pray for me, pray for me in secret, and you don't have to tell me you pray for me. And I'm praying for you, and I don't really, I mean, I shouldn't, 
uh, or I shouldn't uh, tell you, like I shouldn't pray about it openly and just be so, you know, oh, all my brothers and sisters in Christ, God, Father, Lord, Almighty, please, you know, and they, they supplicate and they, they're almost crying. That's not necessary, as a matter of fact, according to the Bible. But these lame churches do it. These lame preachers and deacons, they, get, they do that stuff to be seen of men. It says in, in verse 16, skip down to verse 16, it says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a, sal of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, as thy Father which seeth it in secret shall reward thee openly. Look, I, I come from a Seventh-day Adventist background. I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And Seventh-day Adventists love health and wealth. And one of the things that I was famous for, and not a good famous, was, you know, when I was a hardcore Seventh-day Adventist, I would fast every Saturday. And people knew about it. You know, like, oh, you know, look how... Pie. So people do this stuff. It's not just the preachers. It's also the congregation that's patting themselves on the back. It's lame. You know, because what it is, is it's, it's trying to show, look, I'm not going to go do the real work, the weightier matters of the law. But so you don't notice that, I'm going to show you how good I am in this area. And then so that people go, oh, man, you know, Brother James, man, he, he, he looks really bad. He, he's a good faster. That guy, man, he's just sold out for the – no, it's not like that. I mean, I shouldn't even know if you're fasting according to the Bible. Go to Matthew 6, verse 19. You just continue reading there. It says, Lay not up for yourself, yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break in through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is in the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, you know, being money. And, and what's interesting here is that that's what happens with these guys. These, even these independent fundamental Baptists have their retirement plans, and they have their nice house, and they have their two cars, and they put their kids through college, and they have their Winnebago for traveling. You know, they have the, the American dream life. You know, these guys that, these pastors that, that, I, uh, that I congregate with, some of them I call my friends, some of them I just don't. Every time I've been to a soul winning marathon, I've not paid for a meal because the church pays for that meal. They want to include people in it. You know, we've taken that same stance. If we do something, we're gonna, we want people to show up, so we're just going to cover that investment, right? We're not asking for a donation for that. We're just going to cover it. God will provide. I've gone soul winning with Faithful Word Baptist Church in Mexico, and I actually, you know, I remember talking to my wife. I was like, man, I just want to go. You know, it's hard to go to Mexico, and I'm going to go with a group. All those people, we set money aside, and I, I budgeted for trip and hotel and food and transportation, and when I got there, all I had to pay for was my, my plane ticket there. They took care of meals and transportation and my hotel room. Everything that we did there was taken care of so that we could just focus on so winning. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of work that I want to do. You know, these churches get up and they're like, oh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get a new building fund. So now we're going to have a new check mark on our envelopes because we're going to knock this whole building down and build a newer one that's nicer and fresher and more modern than the last one, and we need to raise $10 million. They're still collecting tithes and offerings, but then they want you to put in an extra just for the building fund. And if they have a missions fund, they want you for the missions fund. And if they have the children's choir, they want you for the children's choir. And if they have the whatever, they want it for the whatever. You know, it's just to be seen of men. You know, it's just to be you, you know, doing the things of men. The Bible says to... That, that we should do it for the Lord, that we should not lay up our treasures here, but in heaven. And that the only way we can do that is that we be single-minded in the light of Christ. You know, that we shouldn't even let wickedness touch our eye, because then it fills us with darkness. 
Because then what happens is then we're double-minded. The Bible says in James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I really think that's the instability that these churches and these preachers have. And a lot of them are saved. As a matter of fact, I'm, you know, I'm not going to knock on them. And just if they're independent Baptists, chances are they're saved in that respect. But remember, we're talking about two different things. Salvation is, is the greatest gift you can receive. It's a gift. But God wants you to, once you're saved, if at all possible, to follow his commandments. And to do the works that he set you out to do, to fight the good fight, and to clean up your life, and to walk straight. Is that necessary? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, that was the argument I had with the guy earlier when I was out soul winning. But if at all possible, that's how we're going to stem the tide. You know, I, I don't want to run too late, so let's just go ahead and close this out. I'm going to go through this quickly. Follow with me. But the last part is the saying. And by the way, I wanted to include there the shame, because the lame... If you're lame, then you, you're shameful in life. You know, you're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You're ashamed for standing for Christ. But, you know, it's just too much rhyming. So it's the fame, the lame, the shame, the saying. It was just going to be too much. But the saying, you know, the only way to have sanity in this life, the only way to have a, a sound mind is through Jesus Christ. It's not what the world says is saying. See, the world would describe sanity as just like not being a murderer or not doing anything ridiculously stupid. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So let's see how we keep our sanity and how then that gives us the ability to fight the good fight. Psalm 19.7, in the meantime, turn over to 1 Timothy 1. And I'll just read for you two psalms real quick. 1 Timothy 1. Psalm 19.7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. See, the first thing you got to realize is we got to get the King James Bible. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. We just talk about the darkness or the light hitting your eyes, right? There, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord's of the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God's talking about judgment there. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And we know this is also a hymn taken from the Psalms. Psalm 119, verse 73 says, Thy hands, Jod, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give, give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. Let, I pray, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be shamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. And they do deal perversely against us, and they will deal perversely against us. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Those that fear thee turn unto me. Hey, come with me. Let my heart be sound in thy statues, that I be not ashamed, that I be not lame. That word sound there, it's not like the sound, like you're making a sound, but it sound like it's entire, unbroken, perfect. It's not decayed. Let it be perfect in thy statues, that I may not be ashamed. 1 Timothy 1.3 says, As I besought thee uh, to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in the faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. How do you have sanity? In, in God's word. Good conscience and a faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have, tur swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of the law Understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for manstealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, there's that word, sound doctrine. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So Timothy's saying, look, 
Your good conscience is in sound doctrine. And don't change that doctrine. And then two more verses and we're done. Go to 1 Timothy 1, 18, and, I'll, and I'm going to read to you 2 Timothy. So just stay, I'm sorry, there in 1 Timothy. But 2 Timothy 1 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not, be, not, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his, his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life, hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the, co for the cause which for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So we see there sound mind in the beginning, sound words. How do you get a sound mind? Through the sound words, the word of God, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love in Christ Jesus. And then closing, and we're going to close out with this because I'm running out of time. 1 Timothy 1.18. Why even preach a message like this? Because I don't think that Christianity is just so that you can go through the motions and play church. Christianity, according to the Bible, is a spiritual war. It's a battle. It's a battle both between the flesh and the spirit. It's a spiritual battle against the spiritual wickedness in high places, against the devil, against you know the wickedness of this world, against the reprobates, against those that are lost and going to hell. We're in a battle. You know, there's one thing that I that I love growing up is you know as a man you always like watching war movies because we like the battle. Well, God's giving you a battle that has everlasting rewards. You're going to be able to reap for all eternity. The Bible says there in 1 Timothy 1.18 says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. See, I love preaching all the counsel of God because these are verses I didn't hear from the lame churches or the famous churches. The Bible says that you might war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. There's that, that sanity again, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. They destroyed it. You know, those lame churches, they've made a shipwreck out of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, out of the battle. You know, if you ever see those movies where they're, you know, they're not prepared for battle and they're like mumbling idiots, they're running into each other, they don't know how to fight back. That's because you're not prepared for a good warfare. Verse 20, of whom is Hymenaeus and, and, and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul is calling people out for not warring a good warfare. You know, if these churches, I'm, I'm telling, and I'm going to say it again, if I, get, if I got it wrong, correct me on it. But I didn't see any of these brothers and sisters in Christ fighting the good fight. I know for a fact Joel Olstein and Ed Young and these big churches aren't going to show up. They're probably lost already. I know for a fact Joel Olstein is. Joel Olstein serves the devil, by the way. He is a reprobate going to hell, and he's sending people to hell. That's my opinion based on the word of God. I don't usually call a name out and then call him a reprobate. These other churches that I named, they're just independent churches. They're flying under the radar. Look, if they're fighting their battles... You know, in their communities, great. But from what I'm hearing is a lot of these independent churches are the ones that are anti-Pastor Anderson. They're anti the new independent fundamental Baptist movement. They're anti speaking out against sodomy. They're anti some of these sound doctrines of Christ. What does it tell me? It says they're making a shipwreck of this war in a good fight. And it's it's about time that they stand up and fight. Look. The battle's coming whether you like it or not. That's what I'm going to close out with. The battle's coming to you whether you like it or not. So why not get ready and just fight it? 
You know, I mean, it, it's not gonna. It's not like it's gonna go away. Once they get through, the, you know, the 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 main wall, they're coming for everybody. If you think you're gonna escape something, you're mistaken. Life's tough anyways, and when you have Christ's light on you, they're, they're coming after you. And, and if you've not studied the Word of God, if you're one of those Christians that got saved but haven't done anything for Christ, that's probably the attack that the devil's doing on you, just keeping you distracted so you don't learn the Word of God. And if you're in the battle, you know what? He's going to keep distracting you so you don't get in the battle. And eventually when you get past that, then that's when the real attacks come. And then the trials and the tribulations and the persecution come. So, you know, don't call out these churches, the famous churches. And tell people to stop going to those things. And then these lame churches, well, if people are going to those churches, say, hey, serve correctly. Maybe you're the one that's going to start that soul winning program. Maybe you're the one that's going to get that sound doctrine to that pastor. Maybe you have an ability to speak to the, someone in authority that others don't. And then you can bring those guys back to the battle. And if you're in a good church, then keep serving and keep getting stronger and put on the whole armor of God so that you can, you know, so we can be more sane in an insane world. You know, today, now, nowadays, I actually have, we have to say there's men and there's women and everything else is a mental disorder, right? Nowadays, we have to say stuff like that because people are so confused. They don't know up from down. You know, the Bible warns us about that, but that's another sermon for another day. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to just be here. Thank you for those that showed up tonight. Uh, Lord, um, you laid this message on my heart and... Uh, the idea when calling these guys out is, is to bring fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can grow and edify each other. You know, the idea is that, and as a matter of fact, we're so busy doing the work of the Lord that if I need to be corrected, I will, but I am not going to engage in, in, in any discussions that lead nowhere. You know, if we're going to go, if somebody wants to call me and, and plan a soul winning marathon or, uh, you know, how we can help this ministry or these brothers and sisters in Christ here, let's do it. But if any of these guys want to call me just to tell me how wrong I am, they can shoot me an email. I might maybe one day have a time to read it in the future. And in the meantime, you know, my prayer is that not only myself, but everybody that goes to this church and Pastor Cobb and all those that are serving here faithfully would continue to just do the work of the Lord. Help us to stay focused and do what you want us to do for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.